Hello everyone. I'm going to put this video in my Crimean War playlist, um, but it's related to a lot of uh, wargaming periods because what I want to do is talk a little bit about uh, the decision making processes on how you go about choosing a particular range of figures to wargame with and connected to that the set of rules that you choose to play by. Now um, I was having a kind of online conversation with Lee Hughes a short while ago on one of his videos because he was he was talking about um, no, actually, it might have been on one of my videos. He, he was he was talking about getting into the Crimean War, and he was looking at the ranges that are available. Um, now, this video isn't going to be a kind of comprehensive guide to the ranges that um, that you can choose, um, but I will mention a few um, and the scales that are available. Um, what what I primarily wanted to do was um, show you a comparison between two figures that are both purportedly 18 millimeter scale, and um, this returns us to another one of my ongoing kind of uh, rants, which is about the complete inconsistency in the way figure manufacturers define their scales but anyway more of that later um yeah so basically he, he lee was um looking at starting up a crimean war project and um it's kind of a topical issue at the moment because warlord um, although they have had a few Crimean War 28mm figures um, available for quite some time, they've recently expanded that range and um, they even went so far as to give away a few free sprues with um, the War Games Illustrated magazine, so they are kind of pushing it a little bit at the moment. Um, I've always admired the um, lancers that they do and uh, would really have um, gone down the route of, of uh, acquiring a 28mm army were it not but for the fact that that's just about all, the, all at the time, just about all that they did and you can't war game the Crimean War just with lancers and nothing else so you would have been kind of obliged to um, seek out other 28 mil scale ranges to build your armies up and use the lancers in in those armies, and then you immediately you get into this issue of um, the the scale definitions not necessarily being consistent and. Um, also the the style of the sculpts and all kinds of things can be very diff different and it's it, it does kind of um, jar with me really to, to, um, having armies like that I mean I do it I've been compelled to do it in the past um, but I mean if you look at these two as I say 18 mil figures here there is no way that I would ever um, have them side by side they are just so markedly different in size and also in the quality of the, not the quality of the sculpt, um, um, but the the artistic quality, if you like. I mean, the one on the right, which is my preferred um, range, Eureka, is so much more lively and, and dynamic and detailed than the one on the left, which is Lancashire Games. 
Um, but anyway, to get back to the, if, if you're starting off with a Crimean War um, project, then certainly the uh, widest availability of figures is is um, 28 mil. Um, I'm thinking of, the, I mean, there's now Warlord, but um, War Games Foundry have quite a comprehensive range, really nice range, and I've always liked Foundry's figures. Um, and there's a very old range um, made by Britannia Miniatures. Um, those, although it's quite a comprehensive range, um, I'm not very keen on them really. They're um, a little bit crude. The um, the sort of sculpting is a little bit, um, as I say, crude and un unrealistic. They look a bit sort of squat and um, things like that. And and that that gets me onto another point really. That uh, especially when I get get on to talking about um, rules, um, is that it's really all. A lot is is down to a, a matter of taste as well. I mean, some people prefer old-fashioned kind of styles of model soldiers to play with, and some people prefer the newer, the more sort of modern, realistic poses and 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 sculpts. Um, but it's it's rather like um, it, getting into an argument about whether. Um, you prefer tea or coffee, and you know if you even if you, you can agree on which is the, the 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 better beverage, how many sugars you have in it, and whether you have it black or white, and what blends you get, and all kinds of things like that. Um, you know, so you can you can get into a similar kind of uh, debate with with wargaming ranges and with wargaming rules and it does it does tend to kind of get a little bit heated um, especially if you're negative about a set of rules um, you know, I noticed recently um, channel boots on the table with Gamer Don um, he was quite critical of the new Warlord Games rules SPQR um, I think quite um, justifiably, but he got um, quite a lot of stick for that. And I've had a similar uh, experience in the past because uh, I am not a fan of sharp practice, although a lot of people are. And um, even though I try to kind of criticise the, the rules in a in a perfectly kind of rational way. I didn't just say they're rubbish, I tried to explain why I thought they were rubbish and um, got a great many dislikes and so on on my on my um, video that I put up on it. Um, so it, it is, it's something that wargamers are very touchy about but there's there's definitely an element of um, fanboyism, I suppose you could call it, um, where you will get slated if you um, make disparaging remarks about a range of figures or a, a set of rules, even if you do it in a completely um, sort of level-headed kind of manner. So you, I'm aware that um, you know this might be treading on some people's toes. Um, anyway, just to take you back to this um, pair of figures here. The, so there, there are plenty of 28mm ranges out there. Um, the problem you then get into is that if you're going to play a 28mm scale war game, set in the 19th century, so I would include Napoleonics in this. Um, you really have to play on a large table. Um, you can't get away with playing it on a six foot 
by four table unless you are playing some kind of um, small action or skirmish game. You can't refight the Battle of Waterloo on a six foot by four table and you can't have an encounter of more than a couple of um, regiments, say, without having it on something larger than that. Um, so the Crimean War is no exception to that. So you're kind of obliged to look at uh, smaller scales. And when I got into the, when I first got into the Crimean War, um, and was thinking you have to plan so far in advance. Um, but I was kind of contemplating, well, 28 mil, even though there's lots of figures around, I'm not going to have the space to war game it in 28 mil. Um, I'm going to have to go down in scale. And um, I do like the black powder rules, but um, they are primarily designed for 28 mil and you will notice um, if you read them that they recommend for the scenarios in particular they recommend table sizes greater than six foot by four um, if you start going down in scale to, to 20 mil or 18 mil or 15 mil then it becomes far more reasonable to play on a six foot by four table using black powder rules and change the measurement distances from inches into centimeters and it works fine um, it, it, it gives you automatically gives you the required playing surface to um, reenact some of the scenarios they've got in the back back of the book and um, there's now been a second edition of uh, black powder out but the first edition um, even has a Crimean War scenario. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that later in this video. Um, but it does need it does need a large, larger than average surface area to play on. Um, so in 15 mil, um, there are a few ranges around. Um, one that I noticed the other day that um, pointed out to Lee Hughes was um, rank and file, which seemed to be a kind of adjunct range to Old Glory 15s. Um, and again, don't don't confuse Old Glory 15s with the 15 mil figures that another company called Old Glory sell. Um, uh, they're completely separate. Um, they're completely separate entities. But anyway, um, rank and file only have a range of British figures for the Crimean War. So again, you've got that similar problem that I was talking about with Warlord games and the Lancers, that, that you can't just war game with one side. You, you're going to have to source your other armies from other suppliers and um, I'm kind of hard pressed to think of um, many 15 mil Crimean war ranges. Um, I would go so far as to suggest that this figure here is closer to 15 mil than 18 mil um, and suggest that you might try Lancashire games but um, then you get into this matter of taste because um, these two figures are both chasseurs d'Afrique so they're French light cavalry and as I say I, I just think there's no comparison really between them and this is a far superior um, a more interesting sculpt so um, I wouldn't be I wouldn't be terribly um, inspired to paint up many armies that looked that had figures that looked like this you know which is another 
Another reason that I went down the route of going with Eureka in that they have some lovely figures, really lovely figures. Um, you know, another another problem being with Lancashire is that this comes in a pack of four. I think it's three pounds or three pound fifty for a pack of four. They're all identical. Um, the Eureka range has three different styles. Um, for uh, the Chasseur d'Afrique, as well as the Command Pack, which are different again. I mean, that's probably a little bit unfair on Lancashire, because they probably have a Command Pack for the Chasseur d'Afrique as well. Um, so there's more variety of poses, they're much nicer to look at to the eye. Um, and I've it's taken me a long time to, be, to paint up my Eureka figures. I mean, I've been at it for getting on two years now and I still haven't finished my British Army but I've never lost interest in it. I've always got something on my work top related to the Crimean War and I've always enjoyed painting the figures so it's kept me enthused and it's kept me you know painting um, which is another thing you have to acknowledge that if you're going to if you're going to start a big project not not a um, not something that's just going to be a, you know, a skirmish tabletop game. Um, something that's going to require a lot of figures. You need to be um, able to cope with that possible kind of weariness that you get. And uh, having nice figures to paint is a way of of compensating for that fatigue. Um, But even the Eureka range, which is so nice, and on the Australian, you can get Eureka through Fighting 15s in the UK, but I've switched now to ordering them direct from Australia for a number of reasons. Um, on the Australian Eureka site, they do tell you that um, the range will allow you to refight famous battles of the Crimean War such as the Elmo and Inkerman and so on um, it's, that's a little bit misleading because even though they do have a reasonably comprehensive range um, it's not a complete range um, and uh, I mean to give you some examples um, they don't do artillery limbers and I always like to have limbers portrayed on the table so that you can represent the guns as being either limbered or unlimbered um, they don't have any figures in great coats and um, the, the weather was so variable in the Crimea I mean the winters were really harsh um, so it's it's not reasonable to portray um, some of the, the winter battles um, with figures that are in their tunics and so on, sort of dressed down. Um, Inkerman is an example of that. It was, I think, November. Um, a lot of the guard regiments were dressed in their overcoats and... Um, the guards in the Eureka range are all in tunics and um, I mean it's not a massive problem but thinking on that point about the um, gaps in the Eureka range um, the guards had um, different styles of busbies um, or bearskins rather um, with the plume on one side or the other or absent altogether and all the guards in the Eureka range um, all have the plume, I believe it's on the right hand side which I think was the Coldstream guards um, that hasn't caused me a massive problem because it's very simple matter to snip it off and model a plume out of a bit of um, 
uh, green stuff or millipark or something and plonk it on the other side or even cut it off and that, I think they were the Scots guards who didn't have a plume. Um, but that is another example of a gap. Um, as I say, they don't have um, any anything portrayed in great coats. Um, few things like that. They don't have any specific rifle brigade figures. Um, not that the uniform was that different from the line troops. Um, there's a few errors in uh, the details on the Eureka sculpts, um, the, the, the sort of swallow's nest type shoulder um, features, for instance, being one that they're, at, they're often absent. A um, few things like that, but, but um, I would still say that Eureka are the best, and this is this is obviously my own personal opinion, um, are the best range to go with if you want to war game the, the Crimean War. But if you are um, bothered, as I am, by the absence of certain things like limbers, then you're stuck really because I've never found um, a suitable uh, alternative range that, that I can source my limbers for instance from um, because they might be there might be some around but there were different scales or different definition of a scale and uh, yeah on this on while I'm thinking about it on this subject um, I can almost hear a lot of you saying this is a tw this is an 18 mil figure and this is a 20 mil figure um, despite the fact that they are both described as 18 and I would go the I would go the opposite way and say this is an 18 mil figure and this is actually closer to 15 but I wanted to put up another another comparison not quite as um, easy to match these up I get them at the same, almost the same depth from the camera. Might might be, um, but you can see here, this figure here is much larger than this figure here, and this figure here is defined or was when it was available as a twenty mil figure. Um, this is a lancer, British lancer from tumbling dice 20 mil range and tumbling dice of do still sell figures but they've dropped their Crimean war range I suspect because it just didn't sell well um, these figures aren't bad um, you know they're not bad they're a little bit kind of stiff and old-fashioned they don't have that uh, dynamism of the Eureka figures and you can't put them side by side in, in an army because they're clearly one dwarfs the other um, but the range as a whole tumbling dice I I paint I bought some painted up quite a few hussars and um, lancers and so on and some guards and didn't did I dropped them in the end I wasn't so happy with them because I didn't think they were as nice as Eureka and I mean to show you one of the reasons why I made that decision this, these are some uh, uh, guards in great coats and um, they also did a range of uh, Highlanders and the way they did it was simply to have exactly the same bodies and you had to glue the heads on so they gave you the sort of kilt you know the the bonnet the highland bonnet instead of the bearskin so the so the figures were identical other than the heads and um you know you would have you would have filled an entire army with everything in great coats and um all with the same poses so I wasn't happy with doing that you know Eureka really kind of uh, 
excel in in all this in all these spheres you know so i i i would seriously recommend eureka um but what i want to do now is talk a little bit about the choice of rules as well so i'm going to swap the camera angles around a little bit so i think i've shown you everything i wanted to show you on the on the subject of of ranges and as i say that's by no means a um a, a comprehensive guide to the availability of of crimean war figures but it rather um a kind of description of the kind of thought processes that you need to make unless you're going to go down down a sort of dead end a bit like i went down a dead end with with these figures um you know to help you avoid that you've got to make make a lot of planning decisions before you make any purchases but anyway so onto the rules which is linked into that right then so i'm a fan of black powder um it's not everyone's cup of tea and i i deliberately use that um expression because um as i said earlier um talking about sets of rules is you know it's a sort of similar kind of discussion as to discussing what kind of what your favorite beverage is um some people like tea some like coffee some like sugar some like milk um you know there's not going to be a universal definition of what a good set of rules is or what an enjoyable set of rules is and um, different people come at it from different angles um, I've always enjoyed black powder um, I know some people uh, intensely dislike it um, a friend of mine at uh, the wargaming club that I used to go to, I, st I still uh, meet quite regularly, have uh, conversations with him, um, hardly ever goes near black powder, he just refuses to play it now. I did, I did persuade him to uh, join in a game, um, an American Civil War game, once using my figures and um, he was perfectly, uh, you know, sort of uh, sporting about it and uh, didn't didn't complain or anything like that. But after the game, you know, he just said he didn't really think the rules were for him. And the reason he gave um, was kind of interesting in a way. And what an example he gave, he was playing the Confederates and... Um, the, the 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 confederate kind of advance just stalled um in the middle of the table um because he kept failing his order dice rolls and you know he remarked at the end of the game that would just never have happened because the confederates were so um you know sort of pumped up when they when they uh made charges and advanced and so on that he would just never get them to stop and falter but you know that that was really his um definition of of the sort of historical reality and in in fact you know you can you can find examples i mean pickett's charge the famous um you know the iconic confederate charge at the Battle of Gettysburg um, you know everyone portrays it as a kind of um, where the where the where the, where the sort of uh, brigade was just broken it just reached the, the stone wall it reached the Union lines so depleted that um, it just completely ran out of steam but the, the sort of battlefield archaeology that's been um, done since that time shows that it's most of the casualties um were were lost at, at when they were at the fence um that, that sort of ran alongside the emmitsburg road and um the charge actually sort of 
you know, the majority of the, the forces actually stopped at the road um, and never climbed over the fence because the, the, the weight of fire was so heavy and um, every time they tried to, you know, knock the railings down, knock the rails down and um, get through the fence or get over the fence, they were just sort of shot to pieces and um, that was where the majority of the of the um, survivors uh, decided not to go on any further and eventually turned back. Um, you know, Armistead got to the got to the lines and famously died, propped up against one of the Union guns. But you know, th that was a small proportion of the Confederate force. Um, so what my friend was complaining about was actually, you know, uh, the rules representing quite a realistic, um, you know, a, an historical um, eventuality. Uh, you know, and I do know, I do, I mean, there's, I forget the name of the channel. It might just be simply called Napoleonic Wargaming. It's a really good um, YouTube channel. The guy really knows his uh, Napoleonic history and, you know, the, the military history as well. And um, he plays Black Powder and really rates it. And the rules were used quite recently for um, a massive Waterloo game that was played up, I think it was up in Leeds, I'm not not entirely sure, I might be wrong on that, but that was this year. Um, so they are used by people who, um, you know, appreciate military history. They, 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 they seem unrealistic in many respects, you know, the fact that you can move sometimes move three moves in one go if you get a successful dice roll and sometimes you can't move at all and things get out of sync but you know I, I think personally that produces a um, by using unrealistic rules it produces a realistic outcome um, but there are other people uh, another person I can think of is um, Ian at BWA Games Nemesis has remarked on the past that black powder is not for him, but you know he says good luck to anyone who does enjoy it. He's not trying to stop people playing it if they enjoy it, and neither was my friend. It's just um, it's not for them. And but as I say, I'm quite keen on black powder, and this this is my first sort of go-to set of rules now for would or would be for the Crimean War when I, when I got my um, figures finally painted. Now, there's a second edition, but in the, at the back of the first edition, there is actually a scenario for the Crimean War, for the conflict. Um, it's called the Crimea River, but um, it's pretty clearly meant to be a, um, a version of the Battle of the Alma River. Um, but the things I want to kind of point out to you really to do with um, planning your army, planning which figures you're going to buy and so on. Uh, if you notice that all the figures um, represented here are all 28 mil. I think these are all War Games Foundry figures and you can see War Games Foundry have a beautiful range including notice artillery limbers which I really miss with the Eureka range. Um, so you could you could build up a complete army using foundry figures but the 28 mil and if you notice here I don't know if you can read that the distance the camera's at but the table um, is nine foot by five feet with the Alma River running along the full length. So you need a big table, you need a lot of playing space. Um, if you convert inches to centimeters and play it using 15 or 18 mil figures, um, you can easily get it on a six foot by four table. And um, that's that's what I do and that's that's one of the reasons why I chose not to go down the 28 mil route it's needing a large table. Um, 
that is one of the things I will say about black powder, which is played at clubs a lot. Um, you tend to get people playing it, you know, two people playing against one another on six foot by four tables. And to me, that's one thing that um, I definitely don't enjoy. Um, I've played it on even on a six foot square table once I played it and um, it was just a ridiculous game. The um, the enemy forces were over the my side of the table virtually in the first move and um, you know it just wasn't an enjoyable game. Just couldn't get off I couldn't get off my start line basically. Um, never never I didn't enjoy the game. It has to be it has to, you have to have a large playing surface. So that's a bit like saying, you know, both I and my opponent um, both enjoy a cup of tea, but one enjoys lots of sugar and the other prefers sweetener or something like that. You know, it's a similar kind of argument. Um, playing playing black powder on a s small surface area isn't for me. Um, However, as I said when I was talking about the ranges, if you're going to if you're going to select a set of rules like sharp practice or something like that, um, you can play it on six foot by four table because it's a much smaller scale game. Um, it's more like a small unit encounter or a skirmish game. So choosing your set of rules is is part and parcel of the initial kind of processes of deciding what um, figures you're going to buy as well because if you're going to buy if you're going to play rules that are limited in scope then you can purchase a range that's limited in scope as well because um, you don't need to you know necessarily um, find all the all the correct you know figures for an entire army um, and if you look at the orders of battle here, um, you know most of this you can um, find in the Eureka range, uh, apart from the limbers for the guns, I think, and the and the guards, as I was saying, um, the Coldstream guards. I think it's the Coldstream guards. You know, are, are correct with the plume on the right side, but the Grenadier guards have it on the opposite side. Or vice versa. I can't remember exactly now, but all these other all these other um, units, apart from the, the rifle brigade as well, I've just used um, ordinary line infantry for the rifle brigade, which is on here somewhere. Can't find it now. Anyway, um, yeah. So the choice of rules, um, you know, it is part and parcel of that planning at the very beginning it's really important to plan the course of you know how you're going to build the army up and what you're going to play before you get going if possible don't don't just say oh lovely shiny new figures you know like those warlord games figures because you're never going to be able to do very much with them until they extend the extend the range a lot further um, but you may have heard me talking in the past um, on you know on the videos I put up showing my progress with the Crimean War figures um, is that I am basing them for a set of rules called Age of Valor. Now that is um, perfectly possible to do because the, in Black Powder there isn't really um, a predetermined basing standard as long as both sides are based in the same way doesn't matter they don't they they, they suggest basing them in 28 mil figures having four foot figures on a four centimeter square base and cavalry two figures on a five centimeter square base i think it is but you know that's just a suggestion they're, they're not insisting that you base it in that way so I have based all my figures for a set of rules called Age of Valor. So what is that, you may ask? 
well, Age of Valor is um, an extension of a set of rules called the Age of Eagles. And the Age of Eagles themselves are a set of rules for the Napoleonic Wars which are based very closely on the American Civil War rules Fire and Fury, which I enjoy. Um, this is the uh, brigade level, I believe, um, rather than the regimental level Fire and Fury rules that came out later. And they're very similar set of rules, um, copy a lot of the same mechanisms, but they are by a different, Age of Eagles is by a different uh, author, Colonel Bill Gray. And um, my friend that I was telling you about earlier, who doesn't like um, black powder, plays a lot of 15 mil Napoleonics. And this is his go-to set of rules for Napoleon, 15 mil Napoleonics. And I've played some games, or at least one game, of Napoleonic figures with him using his figures. And it, they are good. They are a really good set of rules. Um, the problem with them being that um, they are much grander scale um, than, say, black powder, um, which I'm going to give you an example of in a moment, because I don't want to sort of linger too long on the Napoleonic set of rules. What I want to show you is um, that Bill Gray, Colonel Bill Gray, has also brought out a lot of supplements for conflicts in the uh, 19th century and the early part of the 20th century. So he has got um, rules, and this is, they are called Age of Valour, the, the whole lot are called the Age of Valour, um, but he's got supplements for the Crimean War, for the Russo-Turkish War, for the Russo-Japanese War, um, for the Austrian-German War, Austro-German War, I um, forget what it's called, was it the Six Weeks War? I think it might be called the Six Weeks War. Um, for the battles that took place in Italy, the Wars of Liberation in Italy and so on, there's, there's an awful lot. Um, you can't buy the Age of Valor as a hard copy, um, but you, you have to buy it as a um, digital download. Um, something I'm not particularly keen on, but um, you know, it's the only way I've, I have of obtaining those rules. And um, I want to sort of try and record, because they're digital and they're on my laptop, I'm going to try and record a video off of my screen. Never, never done this before. Um, using PowerPoint rather than pointing my video camera at the screen. So, um, excuse me if this, uh, this goes wrong or if uh, I sound as though I'm talking at you from a bit of a distance because I've just had to move to my, to my laptop here. If I, if I can get this going, then hopefully I'll be able to edit this in. Um, in a moment. Right, okay, so here we are then. This is the Crimean War um, supplement for the Age of Valor. Um, and you can see um, he's used a lot of public domain um, images. I believe this is probably part of the uh, panorama that's in Sevastopol itself. Um, there's a few kind of oddities about about it. Um, all the pages are headed L'Armée Française. They are in um, 
they are in the uh, Age of Eagles book as well. And um, I might go back to the Age of Eagles book in a moment and show you something in there. So they have all these, um, you know, sort of strange little typos, maybe. I don't know what you'd call them. Um, but here it is. This, I'll just show you. I'm not going to show you the whole thing because I suppose there's a risk that, of um, copyright kind of uh, infringements if I give you too much information in here. But you can see. Um, the table of contents and they actually give you the scenarios they give you are the historic battles so as I was saying a moment ago about the Age of Eagles this is on a much bigger scale I mean the the, the, the reason I hesitated a moment ago was I turned, opened a page of the Age of Eagles and it had the Battle of Austerlitz now this is kind of what happens when when you begin a project you immediately want to war game really large scale battles you know the classic being everybody's sort of like intends to refight the battle of waterloo if they if they war game um the napoleonic period it, it's it's something that you have to you know spend years kind of working towards it's not something you can automatically um you know reach at the drop of a hat um, so they've got three battles in here, Inkham and Alma and the Battle of the Tractier Bridge, which was sort of later on in the war, but an interesting battle nonetheless. Um, but they haven't got Balaclava <laughs> notice, which, um, you know, maybe they, maybe they only had room for three and decided uh, Tractier Bridge was a little bit more doable. Um, and here you've got other Age of Valia expansion modules that you can purchase. If you buy, I forget that there's an offer, if you buy five then you can get them all for, you know, you can get the remainder for free. But I, I didn't want to sort of buy everything. Um, so I just got the Crimean War one, which you're looking at at the moment. I also bought, um, oh, what's it called? forget what it's called it's called something like um, no forget but it uh, but it includes the Russo-Turkish War and the Russo-Japanese War because I also war game the Russo-Japanese War so I wanted to get that and it's a really good supplement but I think I'm gonna stick to as close as I can to the Crimean War for this video so it's going to go on long enough as it is um, yeah, this is from the Sevastopol panorama, definitely, because it says so. So nicely illustrated. Um, uh, it tells you a little bit more about it before you get into the walls proper. But I want to jump straight to the Battle of the Alma. Here we go. And show you the kind of level of detail and the irony that this is now intended to be played with 15 millimeter figures and the table top tells you somewhere. Um, it may take me a while to find this, sorry. There's a map of the table, as how it should be set out. That's just a planning map. Uh, yeah, it's somewhere. Up. Yeah, well, there we go. The gaming table is eight feet wide and six foot deep. So even in 15 mil, this is a massive table. And um, if you remember what the order of battle was like for Black Powder for that Crimea River, Really, all they were showing you, all they had was a tiny part of this battlefield. They were looking more or less at this area here. Um, and down the bottom, of course, you've got the French forces, um, which aren't included in the Black Powder um, 
because the French played an important part at the Battle of the Hour as well. Um, so you're immediately taken back to that, um, you know, initial problem that uh, your plans are always, if, if you want to, if you want to play a certain set of rules, they're going to, they're going to push you towards a certain number of figures. Um, and this is massive. So if you, if any of you are familiar with uh, Fire and Fury, you'll recognise some of these annotations. But essentially, um, each one of these brigades is represented by a number of stands. So that first figure here, eight, eight, six, four, is the number of stands that you begin the game with and then they slowly get depleted um, and fall in in their efficiency and competence and so on as they get depleted um, but if you think that uh, there's about four figures on a stand and you need eight stands for one brigade there that's 32 figures you can see immediately how many figures you need to play this Battle of the Alma scenario. Look at it. There's just masses and masses of stands that you need, and therefore, you know, literally hundreds of figures. So this is not not something to, that can be done swiftly. It needs timing. There's all the French forces here. Here we go with the Russian forces. You know, twelve stands for hussars. Uh, um, you know, it's enormous. It's the Battle of the Income in there, so we won't go on to that. But um, I just wanted to show you that and show you the level of detail of Age of Valor because it is um, it, it is a superb um, way of reenacting historical battles, whether you're interested in um, you know Age of Eagles and the Napoleonic period refighting historical battles or later conflicts of the 19th and early 20th century um, but look at all the look at all the scenery you need all the let me show you a map i don't know whether i can get to it quickly for the battle of here we go it'll be on here the battle of inkerman you've got parts of sevastopol and the battle of inkerman you know the harbor the siege lines, the outer defences such as the Malakoff, um, and the and the um, that's because some of the forces emerged from the uh, defensive area of Sevastopol, whereas others um, came from outside the city around this way, um, and all the fighting took place in this sort of right wing of the Allied armies here. Um, in very kind of uh, difficult terrain, lots of ravines and um, hills and so on, and uh, in fog as well to add to the add to the um, confusion. And lots of scenery, Inkerman ruins are actually, I believe they're a medieval or Venetian castle of some kind, so you need some very specific types of buildings to add into it. Anyway, I said I wasn't going to talk about the Battle of Inkerman. Um, yeah, so really, I want to go back to the um, the table now. So I'll end that. I'll end that recording, and um, I wanted to just finish by talking about all this uh, sort of aspirational aims of war gamers because when I when I got this um, which is only a five or six weeks ago um, I really enjoyed looking through um, you know the Crimean War supplement and it really it really brought a sense of kind of euphoria to me you know my, the, my I got really excited about my plans for what I was going to do with my war gaming armies and so on and it reminded me very much of my early days of wargaming and I showed you this set of wars some time ago um, not some time ago, some weeks ago 
um, the Airfix rules from Napoleonic Wargaming, which I was, you know, I, I began with. Um, but about that same time, um, this set of rules came out called Empire. And I can remember, you know, I used to just sort of, um, you know, dream over the set of rules. And even then I knew there was absolutely no possibility that I was ever going to get all my minifigs figures um, up to a certain size to be able to play this game, um, which is absolutely colossal. But it gave you know I had a I could it gave me a sort of similar um, a similar kind of feeling sense of excitement and the possibilities of wargaming. Um, so I just thought I'd get that out and remark you know remark on it. But um, oh yeah, the the final thing I wanted to say, I think I will say this is it it. it it was a remark that uh, Reese at Busy Bristles made on one of his videos a few weeks ago as well. Um, he was talking about um, uh, painting up a lot of his unpainted figures, but you know he was going to sell a lot of them on. And he, the way he chose whether or not to sell a particular figure or group of figures was whether there was any possibility that he would get to play with them at his local club. Now that immediately struck me as, you know, a kind of uh, thing to remark on because the games that are played at clubs tend to be the, the sort of ones that are easy to pick up and, you know, and play where you don't need a vast number of figures to get going um, where the rules are fairly simple and, um, you know, where there's a kind of mutual and, you know, a sort of common denominators. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> so that people, you know, there's a general consensus that they are all going to play a set of rules like Black Powder, for instance. So, um, what that means is or you would think it would mean is that um, you know if no one if no one you know is aware of a set of rules like the Age of Eagles, um, they are all going to settle on these much easier to kind of grasp rules like black powder and sharp practice. They're more likely to play sharp practice because it requires you know fewer figures to have a decent game. And you're not only stuck into, therefore, into uh, a set of rules, but you're stuck into um, a particular period because he's, he's getting rid of all his, I forget which ones he was getting rid of. I think it was the Afghan war, second Afghan war, or something like that he was selling on. And, um, you know, I think I think there's a great danger in that. Uh, you know, a, another good example is the Osprey Wolves. Uh, you know, there are dozens of them now. They're, they are so kind of... Um, it's almost like fast food. You know, they're very, you can buy them, they don't take long to read, you don't need many figures, and off you go. But there's no um, longevity in them. You know, people people move very quickly move on to the next kind of release and they and they drop them really quickly whereas you know something like the age of eagles you've had to invest a lot of time in it you're never going to you're never going to sort of surrender the figures that you've painted up for it you're never going to kind of give up on your on your dream so which is the more likely to survive in the long term is it black powder or is it age of eagles I have a feeling that, you know, especially with YouTube and the Internet and this sort of volatility and connectivity between people now that war gamers, you know, are in contact all over the world now, not just down at their local club. Um, that this is like a kind of, you know, black powder is a bit like a sort of forest fire spreading really quickly, um, but equally, it, you know, it can burn out. 
whereas um, Age of Eagles is more like um, a hermit living in a cottage in the in the you know in the forest, just stoking his own um, kitchen fire and you keep it burn, keep it burning for for years and you know maybe although I might appear to be the dinosaur about to go extinct you know maybe in another 10 15 years time you know game you know rules like black powder may not be around bolt action may not be around um, and if you think that's improbable just remember what happened to um, you know Warhammer Ancients it just suddenly disappeared along with all the the other Warhammer historical games you know like Trafalgar and um, the, uh, the the Western Wars I forget what they, they were called um, they, they all just disappeared or you know or, or um, Games Workshop pulled the plug on them you know it's far more volatile and can happen far more quickly because the company will recognise that there isn't any commercial um, you know, viability in, the, in it any longer and just decide to, to drop it. Um, so anyway, the message, long video, sorry, but the, the kind of the, 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 the message, the moral of the story is um, if you're going to start any period, wargaming any period, try to have a plan at the very beginning try to know what um, you want to achieve what scale you want to play it at in, not only in terms of the figure scale but in terms of the size of the battles that you want to reproduce and um, look at what's available look what rules are out there look what figure ranges are out there and and so on and try i know it's so tempting you know just to go out and buy everything you think you may need and get, you know build up a massive mountain right at the beginning and then never get to never get to get it painted um, and I am guilty of that as you've seen I've got loads of unpainted armies where things have fizzled out um, but my Crimean War um, isn't one of those I've managed to keep it going um, yeah, so that's it. So plan ahead, and also you can plan it so that you can switch your strategy. So you can plan, say the Napoleonics, you can plan it so your first goal is to be able to play a game of sharp practice, and then your second goal might be that you want to transition on to black powder, and then you know maybe in the distant future you might be considering playing some of the game like Age of Eagles, you know, on a massive scale. Um, but you've got to got to plan it carefully. Right, that's it. Thanks very much for watching, everyone. Bye for now.